What's going on, Okie Magazine? This is Daryl Yoke. I'm here with author Alicia D. Williams. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing really well. Doing How are you? Uh, I'm on vacation and, you know, relaxing, but I heard about your book from my father, you know, here in North Carolina, and um, I just, it was a page turner. I, I stayed up till 4 a.m. last night finishing it. It's, it's that good. So, Thank you. Yes, I, I had to get an interview and, uh, and, and pick your brain about your career and everything. Mm, so, I'm ready. Okay, so... Um, when did you start getting into into writing? Because I know you were in like uh, some other disciplines of the art, from what I understand before, correct? Correct. Yeah. I I um, dabbled in acting after I graduated college. I went to New York mm -hmm. and I did acting. I did everything from stand up comedy, sketch comedy, um, off 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 way Broadway, and <laughs> I ended up writing my own play. Uh -huh. And so when I moved here to Charlotte. I didn't want anyone to control my destiny. Mm -hmm. I know I did the children's theater before. I did a, a few other outlets, but I started writing one woman shows. So I would take historical events and people mm -hmm. and I make a whole show based on it and dramatize it. And I knew I needed more. Mm -hmm. So I started dabbling into folk tales. Okay. I love, love, love oral storytelling and African folk tales and black American folk tales, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, the ones that like she collected. Okay. And I would tell those, but I needed more. And so I end up going to graduate school mm -hmm. to learn the craft of writing, to learn a bit, bit more of it. Uh -huh. And that's how I started dabbling into, well, I knew I had to write the story to graduate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And that's how this story came about. I started exploring um, what I knew, and I knew colorism, and I knew um, I knew certain aspects of the things in here, and somehow God looked down on me and said, "Hey, we're going to publish this book," and just oh, opened up that career oh. instead of talking about it, not allowing me to do it. Oh, that's beautiful. Can we guys? And this is um, this is Genesis begins again. And this was a uh, man. I can't tell you, y'all. Y'all gotta get this book. Like the bling, the yeah. bling. I love the bling. <laughs> exactly. You gotta, show, you gotta, you gotta maybe, uh, put a zoom in on this thing and see. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, congratulations. So, uh, thank can, you. Can you tell us about? Um, I guess first off, what's what's the history? Because I, I, from what I understand, it's been a work in progress for many years. Is that correct? Yes, it took me about five years. Mm -hmm. And what we like to look at artists and think, oh my gosh, it comes so easy. Mm -hmm. But I struggle with self-esteem and believing in myself, believing that I can actually do it. Mm -hmm. When I graduated, I had a good 80 pages, mm -hmm. good solid 80 pages that they had to have. Okay. And, you know, I had the draft as well. Mm -hmm. But I still didn't believe in myself to finish it, to believe in myself to, like, have a book. A year out of my graduation anniversary, I said, okay, I have student loans. I need to finish this book. Other people were getting published, and I'm sitting here holding on and not believing. Uh -huh. And I finished it, and it was so lucky for me. In my graduate program, I went back to for a visit, and, and someone said, I want to read your work. Uh -huh. Now, this author, and she was a faculty member, I never worked with her. She, um, I had her in a workshop where, you, you know, people would come in, you know, you read your work, mm -hmm. and they dissect it. I only had it in a workshop. She said, I want to read your work. And I thought, oh my gosh, when somebody says, let me see something of yours, it's only a window of opportunity. And I knew that I had to get it to her within that window because that's not going to last forever. Right. So I hurried up, did some edits, revised it. In a few months, I got it to her. She gave me edits back and said, here's a deadline and I want you to send it to agents. It took one person to see me and I said okay why me because mm -hmm. everyone was pining for her she was mm -hmm. you know uh, award-winning she's highly respected mm -hmm. everyone was pining for her in that graduate program and I never got to work with her uh -huh. and she said when you got here you worked your butt off mm -hmm. you didn't know anything about the craft but you worked your butt off and that just goes to prove you never know who's watching you, right? you know, exactly. and observing you. And she saw me as a hustle. And she also said, you know, and you're a single mom and we kind of need to stick together. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I, you know, <laughs> thank you for recognizing that. Uh -huh. And so um, I graduated in 2013. Mm -hmm. I had the book deal in 2015. Wow. And 
It was supposed to come out in 2017, but you can't really rely on publishers. They pushed it back, pushed it back, and it came out in 2019. And I know that it took a good five years of revising and uh, pausing and then coming back to it to get this story to be what it was. Oh, man. And then when you get the revisions or get the, the memos that you have to revise, like, uh, is it encouraging or does it kind of drain you like getting, doing that process? It, you know, <laughs> I have an old school editor. Uh -huh. And I'm very lucky because, as one other author said, we have someone who takes the time. Mm -hmm. She would send 13 pages. 13 pages. The first page is, oh, I love this. This is going to be an amazing book. Oh, this this is so amazing, blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. And the rest of the pages, what about this? You need to work on this. How about this thing? You need to go here. And I was shut down. I was shut down for almost two weeks. Like, I thought you liked the book. What do you mean? <laughs> and then, you know, the last paragraph is like, and this is going to be so great. 13 pages of feedback plus the hard copy uh -huh. printed out of the manuscript all marked out, you know, with page and do this, what about this, and what about this? Mm -hmm. And it's just so overwhelming. It's wow. such a, it's like a major construction job. Uh -huh. And I remember celebrating my, not that, you know, it was going down to William Jean 13 to uh, 7 to 5 pages, but I remember going through my manuscript and I finally got to one page that didn't have a single mark on it. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh my God. I got a page that doesn't have a mark on it. And then I noticed a typo. I was like, oh. Oh, no. <laughs> oh man. It's, it's a lot of work. But I do say, yes, it is defeating because your ego has to be strong enough to say, I know it's not the best. Mm -hmm. Let's get it there. But if I didn't get all those revisions, I don't think it would have gotten as deep as it was. To win these awards, right, or to really flesh out and um, middle grade and young adult people think, oh, it's just an easy genre, mm -hmm. right? And it is. And then there's some books that are like, oh my gosh, to stay with me. Mm -hmm. I wanted every character to have an arc, mm -hmm. to have something that they needed to change. Gotcha. So the father. You, you know, we deal with some heavy issues mm -hmm. and I wanted to show the human side because we tend to look at people mm -hmm. and we judge them for whatever struggles they have. Mm -hmm. Oh, I would never drink. Oh, I would never put my family through. I would never. How dare. But we don't understand what makes a person who they are. So I kind of needed to go deeper into exploring who these people were. Mm -hmm. So you come out knowing a little bit and probably have an empathy. Right. Having a lot more empathy for people. Yeah, because I remember me personally reading the book. I was getting there. I was like, I remember it was around two in the morning. I was like, okay, I can wake up and finish. And I was like, dang, I got I to gotta keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and it, so a little bit about Genesis It Begins Again. It's a, it is a middle grade novel. And it's about a girl who hates herself. Mm -hmm. She hates her dark skin. And she, uh, she hates her uh, natural hair. And she goes about changing it. It's only she's beautiful, like light skinned mom with beautiful long hair. Mm -hmm. Then dad will love her and he'll do right. And it's in the reach to the core of us not feeling good enough. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, finding that one thing that makes us unlovable and we all have that one thing that people are like, oh, you need to change and oh you will be just right. Right. That makes you unlovable. And it really explores the aspect of colorism. Mm -hmm. And I was I was scared. Right. I was scared to really tackle this. We don't talk about colorism. Mm -hmm. And colorism is that discrimination within one's community based on light skin and dark skin. Mm -hmm. And it happens in every colonized country. Yeah, I was about to say, you know, I mean, uh, this is kind of from an African-American perspective. But I mean, like me being, uh, my mom is Mexican-American. And in, even in the Latin culture, that stuff is very prevalent, too, you know. Um, and um, it, it's it's a topic that you said, it's, it's kind of taboo sometimes or like it's kind of assumed that you know it. But. People sent from the outside world or, but are not familiar with it may not really know about this, you know. Yeah, I got a lot of people um, who aren't um, familiar with it. And I was so surprised because as much, you know, bleaching creams, as much advertising from uh, different soaps and, and uh, makeup products to have glowing, they use cold words, brighten your skin, let's make your skin glow, when it's Technically, we just want to 
bleach our skin lighter right. and how many celebrities are actually doing that mm -hmm. and it's not always lighting it's not always makeup mm -hmm. it is a uh, it's a, a, a epidemic and we think that you know the lighter we are the more privileged and here in america of course it stems from uh, slavery days mm -hmm. and it's and marrying up we tackle all these ideas of you lighten a race and you have more privilege, you have, you're have you more acceptable. Mm -hmm. And even to this day, I, I thought I was over it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I really thought I handled, because my mom is a light skin and all my mom's side is light skin too. And I have family who could pass. Uh -huh. And then my dad is dark skin. And I really thought I was over it. But when I was writing it, I became so much more sensitive to it again. Uh -huh. And I remember being at a, a, a club and when my cousins, are, all my, they're, they are light and, and ambiguous, depending on the color they wear their hair. Mm -hmm. And we're coming out to the restroom and, you know, our guys hang around and they're like, ooh, you know, like goggling at them and making comments. And I'm the last one to come out the restroom. Mm -hmm. And of course, I have locks. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm the last one. And he goes, Oh, you did chocolate with on a bunch. And I literally like Oh no eyes, you know, <laughs> I'm fighting back in tears because I didn't realize it would still have that effect on me instead of saying, you know what, you need to shut up because I you know, right. instead of like having a comeback, it was like, Are we still doing this? Am mm -hmm. I still having to go through this? Am I still unlovable? Right? Right. And it just <laughs> like and I see I see me working in education, and I saw it so much even in our little ones. Mm -hmm. Our little ones not choosing the skin tone that represents their skin color, right? Right, yeah. It, 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 we, it, it is time to talk about it. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about it enough. Yeah, I, I agree. I, um, so it seems, it seems like a lot of the, the main character was coming from your own personal experience. Is that, is that fair to say? or I borrowed it, but I had to divorce myself. Okay, it, yeah. uh, because I'm one, I'm not as courageous as she was, okay, and yeah. I'm a lot, lot more boring. But I borrowed certain aspects of it, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't want to make it a singular story. Like my experience with color with colorism is going to be so different from someone else's. Right. So I did yeah. a lot of research, and there's so much research out there. Um, you know, Dark Girls, Bill Duke did the documentary Dark Girls, and he did one, uh, Light Girls. Mm -hmm. So having a balanced perspective of colorism on a lighter, you know, the mom is light skin, her experience of colorism. Mm -hmm. uh, I did research on, uh, there's a lot of videos on YouTube as well, on people on skin bleaching and why they even do it. And watching the depths of putting the cream on and putting saran wrap and Wondering how, what would take a person to go through that to make them want to sleep in bleaching cream, knowing that it could damage them, it could give them cancer, right? right? So that's, I knew I would never do those things, mm -hmm. or I didn't have the courage to try it. Yeah. But what would make somebody else do it? So I had to kind of step away from it mm -hmm. and really explore, let the character speak and make these choices. Uh, I see. And, and in your research, uh, I know you say you did some stuff on the internet. Were there any like interviews of people who had had done the, the bleaching themselves, or like? Yes. Yeah. There were a lot, and they're not only here in America. They're um, I saw some from in Jamaica, mm -hmm. India, and Africa. Uh, you know, of course. Um, and I also saw, and I kept it in my mental rolodex. Mm -hmm. There was a show, My Strange Addictions. Okay. Right. And I remember watching this uh, woman, this young uh, lady who was addicted to bleach baths. Oh, wow. And I knew, and I talk, I spoke uh, to a friend who, grandmother used to put a little bleach in there. And I guess back in the day, mm -hmm. you know, they put bleach in, just a little bleach because they felt like it sanitized the skin. Uh -huh. Or and someone else said something about eczema, it helped with that. So I did a little Googling research on that because my editor would not let me put the bleaching in there, putting bleach in there, what she took a bleach bath. Uh -huh. And I said, well, you know, that it, it does happen. I saw this young lady do it. Mm -hmm. She was addicted, she wanted light skin. It didn't turn her skin. Yeah. But psychologically, she thought this bleach was gonna cleanse her. But, and it was the fear of, are we gonna send this message to kids? Mm -hmm. It's okay to take a bleach bath. 
Gotcha. Right. Uh -huh. And it's a lot of weight of heaviness. Like what kind of slack am I going to get if people interpret it the wrong way? Mm -hmm. And so I had to handle it in a way that, no, I'm not saying it's okay, mm -hmm. but look at, let's examine this girl doing it in a way that, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, is that me? Would I have done that? You know, yeah. it's a, it's a heavy, it's a heavy fine line on trying to, it was scary writing this, you know, at, at, at times. Yeah, but it was really good because you can, I mean, she kind of goes through her thought process as to why she's doing this. I, I think it was, uh, the, I think the intention came across really clearly. I mean, like, you know, she's thinking like, I, I don't want to get too much of the book oh, away, yeah. but. Like, <laughs> the spoiler, she got enough spoilers. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was like, but I was like, oh man, like she's kind of having this really, you know, turmoil in, in her, you know, inner conflict that's going on because of this identity. You know, they were talking about, you know, um, yeah, I mean, there's so many layers to this thing, and I, it's interesting to hear the the history and and the and the the, the what is it the research that's going into this. Uh, there was another part of the the, the book that I wanted to ask um, uh, as far as the research aspect. There's so many musical references, and me being a musician, I, I just <laughs> I just zoomed in on it, you know. <laughs> so, so was that like from just growing up knowing about this history, or did you go through and research it prior to writing it, or is it because of the the musical experience that you were talking about prior, you know, earlier? You know, I am from Detroit, uh -huh. so the Motown <laughs> City is you know the Motown house is right there. I I grew up with music, mm -hmm. and I always wanted to sing, mm -hmm. you know, in the church choir, but I cannot sing a lick. <laughs> but I visualized myself really on the stage, killing it. Yeah. And it just came about naturally. Um, it, it, it started off with a wall. Okay. She wanted to, I, I thought maybe if I have these images of women that could be role models on a wall. But at, at, at one point, I was just throwing off everyone up on the wall. Uh -huh. And I and through the revisions, the way we find our voice is a lot of times through the arts. Mm -hmm. And somehow I started making a connection mm -hmm. with, um, because she is, uh, she, just, she loves music. Started making connection with um, these artists, not just what they sang, but they had these struggles right. with acceptance, with um, parents, mm -hmm. like Ella Fitzgerald. You know, I didn't know she was uh, in a child orphanage and Billie Holiday, you know, having to be so strong and, and work as a young one at a, at, a, um, at a James. But then it was so much more because every black family and, and white, every family, we have music. I grew up with my aunt. Every Sunday, playing the clock, clock six, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the clock sisters, mm -hmm. and you, you brought the sunshine. You know <laughs> that was the thing, and music was a connection. Uh -huh. And you look at movies, and everyone connects, no matter what. That's why the soundtrack resonates, and it kind of is the soundtrack of her life. And it was organic. Like people always ask me that, you know. Um, it did do the research did come mm -hmm. with um, finding those singers who really had issues that can parallel her. Right, exactly. Yeah, because it wasn't just like by random selection or something. Like you had this idea, like this is going to connect with her because this is how her life was. So was, yeah, I, I found that really interesting. When I was reading. I was like, oh, okay. I, I, I was like, I see where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, honestly, I remember in. It's so funny how every um, thing that has happened sometimes in my life has come back. I remember when I was in New York living and I went to the library, like the main library in New York City. Uh -huh. And out of boredom, I guess, and I walked in and put on the head. That's when they had the headphones and you could listen to the albums. So old school, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, I remember. And I love that. And I remember getting a Billie Holiday album putting it on and i remember just hearing you know that old school crackle mm -hmm. and i remember hearing in my solitude and how i felt right is anybody else like do you oh my gosh <laughs> and i that stayed away and i kind of was like that is what music is like mm -hmm. oh my gosh do you do you, did you hear that? Right. That, and so that's why I think music was one of those things that spoke because it kind of 
awakens something up inside of you. It does, you know. I mean, it's funny. I mean, now that I'm getting older, it's like I was on tour recently, and like me and the musicians were like turn on the radio randomly, and we're just like, "What is going on now these days?" Like, <laughs> I was <laughs> That's like, insane, is it? Yeah, I'm like, you know, it's uh, ain't nobody singing, nobody rapping. I was just like, "Oh my goodness, this is kind of depressing." Like, <laughs> but see, because then you have people like Bruno Mars, and I kind of threw him in there, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 like yeah. just one line there, Bruno Mars, who is still uh, bringing in that old school feeling right exactly. kind of like hey you know this is good it sells still you don't have to follow a trend yes yeah, it's, it's still relevant you know you know melody and and actually being able to sing rather than just going behind a computer and getting fixed it's it's still a craft it's still, it's still oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, oh man but yeah it was so much i mean uh you know, I, I went to school in Michigan State, so I, I wasn't too far oh. from Detroit at one point. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh, Farmington Hills. I hadn't heard that in years. You know. <laughs> that yes, yeah. yes, yes. And I had to do being in Charlotte, um, cross check everything. Uh -huh. Like, mom, remember Sherwood Forest? You know, like these areas and what they might look like, and how much a house. I think it was so grueling. The questions my editor would ask me. Like the a price of a, a meal. Yeah. Like it was a food truck. How do you know? And I'm like, oh gosh, let me Google price of, you know, like tacos or something, you yeah. know, a food truck to make sure it was relevant mm -hmm. or the price of rent, you know, or like um, the mom had a job. Where does mom's money go all the time? I'm like, this is a lot. Like our kids are going to want to care. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like almost like, like, like filming a movie or something, right? Like, it's that attention to detail. It's that attention to detail. And at points, working with an editor, it just is grinding because you're like, what's the point, you know, of certain things, of arguing little things like that? But I think that I learned so much, though, mm -hmm. in that process. Okay, I see what you're saying. What you're saying is, let me kind of find a way to shift it and kind of embed it. And I will restructure the sentence without putting the information in there, but putting it in there. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. So it's just finding a way to rewrite the story to to make it, the reader not know that they're getting information, but they're getting the information. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like subtly sneaking in there. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> oh, man, yeah, I mean, there's it's so many so many great things in, in this book. I, I, I want to go back and read. I'm at the Take it on the airplane with me, and then <laughs> and just hit. my dad will find out later when he sees the video. Don't tell him. Yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, but I mean, yeah, the musical thing. I mean, and then there was the colors, mass, and then just I think that the you know aside from the heavier topics, just the, the the experience of just being an adolescent and, and starting a new school and these these things, you know, these growing pains that we all can relate to. Uh, I think you know whether you're going through something as traumatic as the main character, or even just you know having it easy as like some of her friends, you know, or at least maybe easy compared to her in our eyes, maybe, you know? Yeah. I think even starting the school, I, I get it from not just an adolescence, but putting myself in that position, like starting a new school, what that would be like. Mm -hmm. We do that all the time, even as starting a new job, starting. And so her navigating friendships, and I would tell, and I, when I speak to audiences, you know, kids always want to know, you know, how why is it so difficult to make friends? What? And I remember my daughter, and I remember myself, you know, what friendship really looks like. So many times we want, even as adults, we want to be with the popular people, even as adults. The ones that's always on Instagram and have the grand life. And since kids were ingrained that that's what identifies you. Right. But that loyalty, good friendship might be coming out of that one is sitting by themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. And I kind of want to say sometimes and explore, sometimes it's okay to walk away mm -hmm. from friendships. Yeah. It's okay to say, I am not getting what I need. So when I was writing Genesis and, and when I speak to students, so my daughter I did not have a good high school year. Right. You know, I mean, some of her years, she had to pull back. She told them, listen, this is what I don't like. Stop treating me this way. Mm -hmm. Over and over again. Finally, finally. And I just saw her just walking alone and not having this big group. And as a parent, I'm like, no, I want you to be the social butterfly. I want friends all around you. I want kids at the house. You know, it wasn't like that. Finally, she told them, listen, 
Uh, I told you enough. Stop doing that. It makes me feel small. You won't do it. So we're done. Mm -hmm. She had the ability to say, I love you. I love me mm -hmm. more than you tear me down. That's great, though. That's amazing. And I was like, what? And she went to prom with a whole different a friend group and like in a junior with the juniors. And, mm -hmm. and she was okay saying, instead of suffering in that group, mm -hmm. laughing at jokes that might have been on her behalf, you know, mm -hmm. I love me more than you continue to stay in this friendship. Right. And I thought, how even as adults we stay? And friendships way too long because of loyalty or because, you know, what if we don't have anybody, you know, that was, that was a message for myself as well. Mm -hmm. Like, it's okay to say, maybe we need to pause on this friendship. And I want people to say, you don't have to say anything toxic. You don't deserve to say anything toxic. No, that's, that's, that's very true. I mean, yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, I mean, even thinking about some of the relations I have in the music business, I'm like, uh, it's probably best I don't talk to this person anymore. You right? Know? Right? <laughs> it's just, you know, sometimes distance is like, uh, what is it they say? It's, it's a blessing in disguise or it's, you know, it's less stress, you know. It is less <laughs> stress. Um, and I've had to do that myself and how to find, a, and I think we don't know how to have that tough conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. It's really right. to be awkward. Sometimes. It can be yeah. awkward. I'm, I'm working on having those tough conversations and finding my voice as well to say, I need to pause this. Or mm -hmm. we need, like we used to tell our kids, you need a friendship break. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, but yeah, it's, 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 and I want those messages, those underlying messages mm -hmm. to really, and I like the de dedication is for, uh, all of those who have never felt like they were good enough, you are and will always be. Because there are so many aspects in life that will kind of put labels on you, that will make you be in a box or, you know, like, and tell you and define you. And I really want people who read this, my readers, to come away with, like, saying, you know what? I can define myself. I can choose what beauty is for myself. Mm -hmm. Like, who gets to make these standards on what, beauty is or what you should be mm -hmm. exactly exactly. right mm -hmm. and i want you to say nope this is who i am i know you want me even family you know friends we always you know people want to put us in these categories or or put us in these per perimeters mm -hmm. and i want us to say nope that's not who i am i choose to be who i want to be or you know like genesis in her idea of what beauty is and mm -hmm. beauty is a light skin long hair no i value me this is beauty, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. I mean, yeah, it's, um, wow, I, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of at a loss for words because there's just so many things running in my mind as far as like what to talk about with this thing. Um, but uh, I could spend all day talking about this. I wanted to ask, so um, after it came out, like, um, was it immediate success? Like once they, like, they got to the publishers and like the release date, what was the journey like after it was released? Right. Uh, it released in January yeah. and, um, uh, it was quiet. Oh yeah. It was quiet, and and my agent said, "Don't worry. Mm -hmm. You know, some books are slow roll." Mm -hmm. And I was like, "I don't want to slow roll." You know, <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. It started picking up buzz. Uh, New York Times did a review, and it was great that they did a middle grade, right? Uh -huh. uh, the New York Times compared it to the Bluest Eye, mm -hmm. said it's the Bluest Eye for uh, middle graders, mm -hmm. and I would thought. Wow. And I thought it was going to take on a new, oh, wow. It didn't do that. Uh -huh. And then I got uh, an NPR interview with Ari Shapiro. And I thought, oh, wow. It didn't do that. <laughs> it didn't do anything. And then um, in June, I think it was maybe in June, uh, it got all the, the next year uh, when it came out that it won. Uh -huh. And it, it, it started picking up, but not still not. Because it's middle grade and you really can't um, push it because your readers aren't on Instagram or face of social media yeah. and you're relying on teachers and ed educators because that's who they pushed it out to. I see. And so it, it what has done great for is novel study reads in schools. And I've had people reach out to me um, who study children's literature in college programs. Uh -huh. Oh, like, your your book is on our list. 
And so it's it's getting that kind of recognition. Nice, nice. Not the big bestseller, New York Times bestseller, or any of those yet, mm -hmm. um, hopefully. But it's getting people who are like studying it, and I'm like, you're studying. That's amazing. Yeah, you're studying this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm I'm honored in that manner. Yeah, because yeah. it's funny because like uh, I mean that's that's, that's, the thing, that's an amazing thing because I remember uh, in high school I was studying uh, uh, Zora Neil Hurst. You know? Yeah, you know, I mean I think it's when we we Their read. Eyes uh, were watching God. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I would I'd be lying if I remember everything from if I say I remember the book at this point. It's been twenty something years, but I, I have it still. I want to go back and reread it. But that was one of my favorite. Like at one point, if you never watch the movie I, I wouldn't force people to read the book but if you were coming over my house <laughs> you want to watch the movie that yeah. over at the end yeah. with holly berry and michael ely like uh, oh i got a, I got a solution come on sit down and it was like <laughs> no i'm not coming over you're gonna make me watch that movie <laughs> and actually wrote the uh, zordale hurston picture book biography uh, and, and that was after this one right oh. after this one okay. yes oh so i that's gonna be one of the other questions is like uh, after this one it seemed like uh you know, the accolades start coming in. Was that the impetus to start writing the next projects, or did, were those already happening like before? They were happening. Um, actually, I was writing the Shirley Chisholm uh -huh. picture book biography, okay. but it was I didn't know how to do it, mm -hmm. and I kept giving up trying to figure out how to write that voice of Shirley Chisholm because Shirley has that clip. A uh, uh, voice in that British, you know, accent, uh -huh. and. I kept trying to play with it, but Zora, Zora came, mm -hmm. her voice just came to me and it was one of those, ever heard a story about Burr Rock, Burr Fox, what about lying, and, and it, the words came, mm -hmm. and, and, and I started doing the research of it, of her, and it kind of flowed in a storytelling voice for me, and I think that came because I did the storytelling allowed for so long okay and that one came out before Shirley Chisholm was bought mm -hmm. um, I sold that one and with picture books it takes so long because once you get it out mm -hmm. it goes to the illustrator mm -hmm. the illustrator has their years with it oh yes. wow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I don't like telling people oh yeah I got a picture book coming out because it could take two or three four more years before it comes out, depending on how long the illustrator takes with it. And do you get to pick the illustrator, or is that uh, is that uh, by the the publishing company? Or I don't have that clout yet, but <laughs> oh, okay. I got the illustrator. They pick the illustrator and show me like with um, a, a jump at the sun, Zora. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have the illustrator and like, we love her. Don't you love her? And I just happen to love her. And it is a beautiful marriage because she's so fluid in movement in her illustrations. Mm -hmm. And with uh, Zora was a, I mean, Shirley was a different publisher. Mm -hmm. And they already had um, someone already assigned to it. Mm -hmm. And she's a fine artist. Mm -hmm. And people, two, it's to totally two different ways with one is traditional structure. The other one is not. Mm -hmm. And one is like traditional type of flat work, and the other one is not. Oh, so yeah. it fits so well. And but, but my problem was writing another novel. Oh yeah, that's it's kind of like I know maybe it's the same uh, for me. Like having to, after I finished doing an album, I'm just like oh. I, I, and it's, <laughs> but it, and it's so exhausting because it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But um, and I didn't have a follow up. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a follow up manuscript. I did. But it was so much happening that I put it, I was like, it's not working. Mm -hmm. But then last year with COVID, and then um, I made the mistake of going on Twitter. And you know how the videos automatically play? Yeah. It was about Aubrey being shot down. Mm -hmm. And I saw that. And I, with COVID being isolated and seeing that video, my anxiety, everything hit. And I couldn't put two words together. Where other people said, oh, I wrote three books during the uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. I was in an emotional struggle mm -hmm. of, of what to tell. And so I'm, and then after life started moving again, I had to come clean and, and really say I was dealing with fear. Because yeah. even though this didn't reach uh, commercial success, mm -hmm. it, in the literary world, mm -hmm. it hit you know with the stickers and the awards right so it hit in a way that my gosh are they going to expect that again from me 
Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like you get the first prize this time. It's like, can you do it again? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can do it again. What are they gonna say? You know, in that anxiety. Mm -hmm. So I'm pushing through that, and I'm just trying a whole different genre. Mm -hmm. That way, I can um, or style of writing per se, I same see. genre, style of different style of writing to see if I could just one break that break the what is expected mm -hmm. because like everyone expects another genesis right uh and they want and, and the part two they want to know what happened to genesis i was like well she's fine you know <laughs> 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 what about mom i'm like she's fine like yeah they're gonna know about their life and mm -hmm. i've gotten i need to know what happened mm -hmm. and i was like i can't do that right now mm -hmm. so i need to do someone totally different that's not connected to the story. Yeah, it's just kind of separate, get a little distance, let it breathe a little bit. Let yeah. it breathe. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, it's funny, I was reading this and I just had a thought as we were talking about it. Uh, you know, I think this is one of those stories that it could be like, a, you know, like clay animation or like some type of animated movie. It, it's that, it flows like that, y'all. It's, it's that good, you know. I've gotten that, like, people keep saying, you know, it, why isn't this a movie? Why, you know, it just, I see a movie out of this. And what I've gotten is, it's hard to, most people haven't done um, middle grade stories. I'm like, what age are you up? Like, put her in high school, freshman, I don't care. But they, my agent said, oh, that, that you know, middle grade is a tough sell for movies um, because it's all about marketing. Mm -hmm. And plus, it's not a Disney type of happy ending, you know. Oh, yeah. It's some, it's some stories in here. It's a hard read. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm guessing they don't know how to how to do it yet mm. let's see we got i'm sure there's someone out there up, up to the task so there's someone's <laughs> out there I mean, it's, it's i mean like um you know it's like the, the end comes and i'm like i know sun is gonna happen but then it's like which way is it gonna go and it's like oh it goes it goes this way like it looks like it's gonna go the way you think then it goes this way you know yeah, no. so it's um no it was it keeps you on the edge like i said i mean like I was at 2, 2 a.m. I was like, okay, I, I can wake up and finish the rest before we talk today. I was like, nah, I got to keep going now. I want to <laughs> know what happens now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to make it reflect real life. It is not, it is not one, and it's, it's, not, it's not a sad ending. Trust me, it's not. <laughs> but I want people to know, like, every day we struggle. Mm -hmm. You don't automatically wake up and like, oh, I love myself. You look at Lizzo. Who loves herself, you know, enough to do, be her, but you have blah days. Right. You have, it's a, it's a, it's a struggle to say, otherwise there will be no Botox. There will be no cosmetic surgery. There were like, it wouldn't be such a, we wouldn't be on a rat race to attain this constant, you know, updating our beauty mm -hmm. if we were like happy within ourselves. So I kind of want to reflect, yeah, it's going to, it's going to happen, mm -hmm. but it may not happen and this story, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, because exactly. <laughs> uh, Pete Walker's still going to remind you. Yeah. <laughs> you don't fit You don't fit their box or whatever their definition is. So it is a, one of those things that's hopeful. It is, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like it's kind of one of those uh, cliffhangers that uh, and the, 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 the clouds open up and the, the, <laughs> the rainbow, you know. <laughs> it's like, it, it, I thought it was a happy ending. I know it's not, maybe not the Disney happy ending, but I was, I was like, oh, this is a great ending, you know. I told my dad, yeah. woke up, I was like, you got to read this book, you know, like read, read it and like, you know, keep going with it, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's not like the, the package and it's a boat on the top and la -la, everything perfectly works out. Yeah. And I'm thinking, yeah. That would be disingenuous. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, you know, middle school doesn't always work out. It, that does, way. it doesn't. Have, you lied to me. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, but it's, it would be disingenuous. Um, and I think not only children. I think I just think our readers deserve truth mm -hmm. in every story, um, and it has to match. And if you're writing, mm -hmm. or if you're storytelling, or if you're creating anything, mm -hmm. it has to be true. To that story your music can't go into a melody and give a false ending and go up when it's supposed to mellow out right yep. you know it's gonna be like ah that doesn't go yeah but you know like <laughs> but because you have to make sure it is honest and that and in, in whatever you're doing mm -hmm. to keep it all honest most definitely and, and you're also uh, you, you teach at the at the, the the high school here is that right? Uh, is it, uh, yeah, I'm um, actually assisting because so I can fade on and do this full time. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, okay. I, 
Oh, okay, gotcha. But I, I guess my my question was going to be like when you when you're teaching students, how do you get them to tap into their writing style, or are they at the, at the age to where can they develop their own style, or are they kind of just working out like uh, basic storytelling uh, parameters per se? Like when you're teaching. Well, I haven't taught writing. Oh, there. I see. Oh, yeah, okay. I taught history before. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. sorry. I thought I thought it was uh, writing. Okay. Oh, I wish I <laughs> want to teach it on a, a college level. I think because uh, and challenge students. Uh huh. But that's a good idea. Maybe I should go into teaching uh, writing. <laughs> yeah, I think you're very cognizant about how to formulate a story and like how to connect the dots. I mean, like I said, there was no loose ends with this thing. I was like, it was very impressive. I was like, man, I was like, that's all of those revisions. I literally have you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the ones with my editor alone, uh -huh. you know, those big old copy, you know, paper boxes, yeah. the Xerox it. I have a box full of the print out versions of it. Mm -hmm. And I think I went to, through several computers mm -hmm. writing this book. You know, oh, wow. it went <laughs> through so many, so many, so many revisions, so many. And that, I think... What we forget is, like, even writing this next one mm -hmm. is progress and not perfection. I have to remember myself, remind myself, because Genesis went through so much, and I'm writing next one. I'm like, this, this sucks. <laughs> you know, I'm, I can't do this. In every book, you write it differently, mm -hmm. right? I wrote Genesis all on the computer because I had to. Yeah. Now this one, it's a different format. I'm handwriting it. Nice, nice. Just, just letting it flow, right? Just letting it flow, and I'm every every vision. Okay, I'm handwriting it, mm -hmm. and um, and that way, I can I can move it as I need to mm -hmm. to play with it like a puzzle. But yeah, I I think I could do it, but I'm so much learning the process, and I'm learning my process, and I'm also learning that processes change. Yes. Most definitely, most like definitely. when you make music, is it always the same way? No, not at all. <laughs> 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 I might change it within you know a span of thirty minutes. It might be something completely different, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you're but you're always composing music. You're in a car and something might come, or you're playing with your daughter. And you're like, oh my gosh, yeah, I like that. And that's how it is. I might be driving and I have receipts and I gotta write a dialogue you know or I and I saw that Toni Morrison did that mm -hmm. I was like oh yeah I have all these little pieces of paper <laughs> I don't know if you ever watched the movie Five Heartbeats no I haven't oh they did oh. the same thing they uh -huh. got like pieces of paper and they're like rearranging it to make the song okay it's a wonderful you know another family movie with music but uh -huh. it it you're always writing. You're always creating. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're washing the dishes or taking a walk, there's going to be something that comes to you, or it may wake you up in the middle of the night. Yeah, like you know, there's no there's no on and off switch for us. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah it's constantly. I know it's the gift and the curse, right? <laughs> I know. When the character, I'm like, what do you have to say after work in the morning? Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, but you're like, don't, don't, because this might be great. But mm -hmm. if you have glasses. If you can't see, you're like, come oh, turn on the light, put your glasses on, all right, and quick, turn off, turn on. Oh, you're not done? Turn on the light, put your glasses back on. <laughs> it's just like, hey. Oh, it's, it's a good type of torture, right? It's a good type of like, Okay, I'm just going to sleep with my glasses in case you need to speak. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, like, I know you're writing it. Um, are you just letting it floor? Like, are you giving yourself a deadline to finish this next story? or Because I wasted so much time trying to get my mind together. <laughs> um, I want, I want to, I'm on my second revision. I, I did something, I freaked out. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I cannot write this story mm -hmm. because this is not my story to write. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have the best intentions and it might not be, because we think we, oh, you know, I can have empathy for this, I could do it. And I, I probably would have done it well, mm -hmm. But we have in our community own voices, so you don't want to take a, write a story um, if you if that's not a lived experience necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I had a character who uh, was questioning identity, mm -hmm. and it was a male character. And perhaps if I did it from a female point of view, yeah, I probably could write that, mm -hmm. you know. But I said, okay, let me put the pause. Does this character need to experience that to tell the story? Gotcha. Okay. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. How can I tell this story? And so I don't 
take away the story from someone who is in that marginalized community. Mm -hmm. So I had to pull back. So I threw all of that. Like, what can I keep from here? So I took it out the paper book, you know? <laughs> and I can keep this story and create a new story. Create it. Mm -hmm. And so I finished that draft. I'm on my second draft and going through it. Um, I want to... I want to be able to send it to my agent uh -huh. who does, you know, can help me revise it. And so I can have it done by December. If I can send it to the editor and hopefully she'll like it. Mm -hmm. And then I have to trust that my editors will get it to where it needs to be. Oh, okay. So, I'm hustling. Yeah. I am so hustling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so before we wrap up, though, I wanted to ask, or actually, I was wondering if you can share with uh, the audience, like, where can we find your works at? I know it's uh, Simon & Schuster, which is a very renowned uh, publicist, so I, I, that, I heard that name, I was like, oh, wow, that brings back memories <laughs> for me. <laughs> uh, you can find Genesis Begins Again mm -hmm. uh, at any bookstore that you get your books from. They are in uh, brick-and-mortar stock. Uh, stores and if they don't have it they'll be happy to order it please make sure they order it they're at the library if they don't have it make sure they have it at your library or you can get it online from any online bookseller it's pretty um, much everywhere if you're interested in Shirley Chisholm it is Shirley Chisholm Dared mm -hmm. and if you're interested in learning about Zora Neale Hurston which is a great gift is Jump at the Sun the true life tale of unstoppable story catcher Zora Neale Hurston by Alicia D. Williams. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then your website is AliciaDWilliams.com, is that right? Yes. Yeah? yeah. All right. And then uh, are you on Instagram and Facebook and all that all that crazy social media? Yes. Oh, I do better with Instagram. Okay. Yeah, it's easy to, you know, uh, a Twitter. I, I can't figure out the threads and how they work. And it, it, it'd be a time waster for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. I'm an old lady, so. Oh, yeah. I mean, it gets to be much for me, too. Like, I have to check this and this and all that stuff. Yes, it's a full-time job. So, <laughs> I, I think probably needed somebody, a social media intern or something. <laughs> who can wield and do that. But, yes, I like to post pictures and share news through Instagram. And that's author Alicia D. Williams. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you again for, for joining us. And, uh, and, you know, this has uh, been a great interview for Okie Magazine with you. And, um... Hopefully next time I'm in town, we'll, we'll, I'll be able to read some, some manuscript stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, please. Please. Right. Thank you so much. So until next time, we'll check in again with Alicia D. Williams. Thank you.